USA! USA! Let's go! You guys are savage! Let's go! Break it down! 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 Break it down. Open the door! Let's go! Let's go! Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. And that was sound gathered during the assault on the U.S. Capitol building on January 6th of this year. And you hear the crowd smashing the building's windows and the police shooting a right-wing rioter. Um, and this is an excerpt from a recording by the right-wing group Insurgents USA. The following interview has been co-produced by John Riley and myself, Bob Letterer. We're members of the OutFM Collective at WBAI. The violent storming of the Capitol building on January 6th by hundreds or perhaps thousands, which aimed to stop the certification of Joe Biden's election and left five people dead and scores injured, dramatically highlighted the growing strength of the far right. It's a movement that's been steadily building for decades. On this program, we're going to examine the politics, organizing strategy, and increasing violence of that sector. Analysis of the diversity of the movement reveals a frightening array of groups that shatter the mold of far-right groups from even 10 years ago. The January 6th action demonstrates an emboldened, self-consciously insurgent right-wing movement that brought together many sectors of far-right, along with fervent Trump supporters not organized into the far-right, at least not yet. This included some splinters of the old white supremacist and neo-Nazi right, but as we will learn in this interview, Growing sectors of the far right have moved away from open, blatant white supremacy as a central tenet of their organizing, even as they fight for a racist and, in many cases, Christian fundamentalist state. In fact, some of these far right groups have begun engaging in multiracial organizing, which is another new and disturbing development. Central to the politics of many of these groups, particularly the Christian theocratic ones, is an anti-woman and anti-queer ideology that should be particularly alarming to women, LGBTQ people, and our allies. A longtime researcher of far-right organizing, Spencer Suns Sunshine, wrote on truthout.org just days before the Capitol attack, quote, 2020 was a record year for far-right violence in the U.S., unquote. Sunshine cites the rise of the Boogaloo movement, which he calls, quote, a new grouping of younger activists with militia style politics, unquote, and followers of QAnon, who, as Sunshine puts it, quote, believe Trump is always about to arrest a cabal of liberal, deep state, satanic pedophiles. He goes on, quote, aggressive street demonstrations led by the Proud Boys reached a fever pitch inspired by comments from Donald Trump and renewed opposition to the revived Black Lives Matter movement. And uh, he adds, the Proud Boys became an, the undisputed far right street force of the year and were even mentioned in the presidential debate with Trump telling them to stand back and stand by. In Portland, Oregon, where Black Lives Matter demonstrations had gone on for over 200 days, the Proud Boys held a series of violent demonstrations. There were a large number of murders and car attacks at Black Lives Matter demonstrations. The most infamous of these were the murder of two demonstrators by a militia member in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Sunshine also notes the right-wing led and sometimes menacing demonstrations last year against the COVID-19 shutdown in various states, the most aggressive of which was last April when armed protesters pushed their way into the Michigan legislature. Several of these right-wingers wing right -wingers were later charged with plotting, plotting to kidnap and even execute elected officials there. To dissect the role of the far right in the Capitol assault and its implications for politics in the coming period, we're joined by two guests who closely follow these groups for years and have developed expert analyses of them in an effort to aid the, the work of left movements that are fighting against them and fighting for a new society. 
And so I want to welcome Matthew Lyons. He's been writing about right-wing politics for over 25 years. He's the author of the book, Insurgent Supremacists, the U.S. Far Right's Challenge to State and Empire. That came out uh, three years ago. And he's the co-author with Chip Berlay of the book, Right-Wing Populism in America. That came out in 2000. And he's also a regular contributor to the radical anti-fascist blog, Three-Way Fight. And Matthew is a white, Jewish, cis, heterosexual man who's based in Pennsylvania. And our other guest is Chloe, who does investigative reporting and analysis on the far right and related issues. She's also a contributor to the Three-Way Fight blog. Uh, Chloe is a white, Jewish, cis, queer woman based in California. And thank you so much for joining us, Matthew and Chloe, on here on Out of Him. Thank you, Bob. Very happy to be here with you. Thanks for having us. Okay. Um, let's start with some questions about the differing ideologies within the far right. Matthew, um, shortly after the assault on the Capitol, you published an essay that updated your 2017 book about insurgent supremacists. And um, that book was written just after the Charlottesville white supremacist riot. You wrote, quote, the far right hates the ruling class. It believes these elites are using multiculturalism, mass immigration, and globalization to weaken and destroy white Christian America, unquote. Uh, Matthew Lyons, can you define how you uh, see the, the far right and why you argue that the appropriate label is far right rather than extreme right or fascist right? Sure. Um, I think that um, the kind of ideological diversity that you mentioned in your introduction is part of the reason why I take a kind of a, 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 a different approach to defining the far right. I mean, people tend to define the far right in terms of a particular ideology. My definition has two parts. I argue that when we're talking about the far right in the United States and in this historical period, um, we're talking about uh, political forces that first of all, regard social inequality as either natural or inevitable or desirable and also that these forces also reject the legitimacy of the existing political system. And I define the far right in this way um, to reflect a, a particular kind of historical development. Um, if we're talking about white supremacist forces, which are a major part of the far right, although not the whole thing, um, 50 years ago, these were forces that embraced the kind of Jim Crow segregationism that had been integral to um, uh, US society for generations and other forms of explicit uh, racist oppression and, and uh, discrimination. Following the changes uh, that took place in and around the 1960s, some organized white supremacists came to believe that they could no longer achieve their racial goals within the existing political framework. And therefore they needed to either break away from the United States or overthrow the US government. And there were similar kinds of uh, political shifts within other right-wing forces, uh, particularly uh, right-wing uh, Christian groups. And so um, to tie it back in with the, the quote that you cited earlier about the, the, the far right's attitude toward the ruling class, this notion of the existing political system being illegitimate is very much tied in with the sense that the political elites and economic and cultural elites have betrayed them, that uh, the people who used to be defenders of you know, traditional social hierarchies and, and systems of oppression 
they're, they're no longer doing that job in, in the way that the, the far right forces want them to do. As far as the uh, use of the, the term far right versus extreme right or fascist right, um, extreme right is a term that often is used in a way that tends to equate the left and the right extremes, you know, uh, the notion of extremism as a sort of a generic um, political phenomenon that um, is a danger to the, 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 the moderate or rational center. Um, and I very much reject the notion that we can equate the, you know, quote unquote, extreme left and the extreme right. Um, so that's why, I, uh, part of why I tend to steer away from that particular term. As for fascist right, um, I would say that the fascist right is a, a major part of the far right as I've defined it, but there are some far right forces that I would not consider fully fascist, although they certainly all have important elements of fascist politics. Uh, and we may wanna get into more of that later, but um, just uh, in, in brief, uh, uh, to me, um, fascism implies not just a kind of right-wing authoritarianism, but a more systematic effort to transform society, the culture, just, the, the, just all kinds of different institutions to conform to um, a, an overarching ideology. And you can certainly find examples of that within the US far right. But I think there are also far rightists who don't necessarily have that notion of a kind of overall transformation of society. I want to um, turn to our other guest, Chloe, and um, look at the comment that Matthew made in his essay and, and explained just now that the far right hates the ruling class. Now, Chloe, you, uh, in an essay you published on January 13th of this year, you and B. Sandor write the following, quote, we cannot assume that the movement that stormed the Capitol on January 6th was at large anti-state or solely an insurgent movement from below. While elements of the movement were insurgent, this movement was egged on by Trump and other key people in his administration and in Congress, unquote. So, uh, Chloe, tell us how you see the interplay between these two forces, the anti-state and elements of the state, and what this might mean for the far right in the months ahead. Thank you, Bob. Um, that's such an interesting question. Well, one thing I think we need to bring into context here is that there are elements of the far right that are anti-state and even anti-capitalist and even self-consciously revolutionary. Um, what B. Sandor and I were arguing is that the groups of people that came together to storm the Capitol that day were really actually more of a mixed bag. Um, some of them were uh, far right, have been organized since the Obama administration and definitely insurrectionary. Um, but others were really recently politicized uh, under Trump and definitely since Stop the Steal. And it was pretty evident at the Capitol that day that there was no actually coherent um, leadership and that there was, we both would argue, there was no coherent leadership that was actually attempting to fully overthrow the state per se or um, institute a new form of governance. I don't think they were even close to that organized. Um, and there's several significant things about this. Number one is that many of them have been loyal to Trump. And while they are shifting potentially, and we even saw that around that time, some shift uh, from what regime loyal to kind of questioning the regime or even being against the regime, particularly in terms of how they were responding to the police that day, 
I think it's significant that um, some of the movement will are so loyal to Trump that we can't expect for them to continue to be a part necessarily of the insurgent right or revolutionary. Um, I think that we saw like specifically that day, you can see that some of the terrain was already shifting. So for example, how these groups of people that day were responding to the police, many of the people who have been involved in Stop the Steal and even in the MAGA tent more broadly have been also a part of Blue Lives Matter, very pro-police. You started to see some of that shifting even in the lead up to the Capitol takeover. And you really saw some of that consciousness shift even that day where you had some demonstrators talking to the police, um, being close with them, uh, being like, we're on your side, come on, get out of the way now. But you also saw other demonstrators yelling at the police and saying, now, not only do black people hate you, white people hate you too, and telling the police to get out of the way. And so I think it's, it's important to understand that there's a lot of shifts happening right now. But And also, if I could add, uh, also, mm -hmm. a attacking physically attacking police right and physically attacking the police yeah i'm sorry continue oh just that there's definitely shifts happening but i think that um versus a kind of self-conscious revolutionary far right that is anti-state this movement that stormed the capitol that day is more mixed and i think in a state of probably transition as always, but there's there's a lot of possibilities in terms of where elements of it can go from here. And I'm imagining also a lot of splits that are gonna be happening within even that movement between elements that will be more anti-state after what happened at the Capitol and other elements that are probably, you know, more interested in, um, you know, reform or, we're really just hoping that Trump would actually take office and, or sorry, not leave office. Well, picking up on this theme, um, I want to uh, quote a very significant section of um, that same essay that I cited earlier written by our guest, Matthew Lyons, um, which was just published last month in January that um, in which he wrote, quote, in persuading millions of his followers to reject the validity of the voting process, Trump sparked a political upheaval unlike anything we've seen since the overthrow of Reconstruction. A huge chunk of the U.S. population has suddenly shifted, at least temporarily, from system loyal politics to oppositional politics. The size of the U.S. far right has increased by an order of magnitude, unquote. And I think this uh, analysis and the one that Chloe just gave us is really important um, and very unlike what we've been hearing from most of the corporate media and even from a lot of the left media. So Matthew, what would you say is your evidence for this huge shift in the population and or in a segment, the segment of the population and what are its implications both for mainstream politics and for the work that the left needs to engage in to build popular struggles? Uh, very good question. Um, I think that uh, polls that were taken um, last month of um, people in the, the voting population showed that, that something upwards of 70% of Republican voters regarded the presidential election as fraudulent. And um, uh, uh, more than 40% of independents also felt this way. And in a political system that is founded on elections, is founded on the voting process, if you are saying that the election of the president is fraudulent, is, is illegitimate, then you are at least at this time saying that the, the government is, is illegitimate, that the, 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 the people who are in power should not be in power, that they have no right to be there. And um, this is, uh, you know, 
going back to what I said um, earlier about the way that I define the, the far right, I mean, you could also call it the oppositional right. It's this uh, divide between those who want to achieve and believe that they can achieve their goals within the existing political framework and those who believe that that isn't possible, that that's not an effective framework for what they want to do. And these may be people who share the same or similar goals, um, but, they, but they have very different uh, notions of how they, that can be brought about. It's a different side of um, the situation, sort of a different way to put the emphasis than uh, where Chloe was putting the emphasis uh, a little while ago. I, 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 um, I, I think Chloe is, is quite right to emphasize the complexity and the uncertainty um, and the, the instability of the situation. Um, but another side of that is this is a major shift. I mean, you know, if we're talking upwards of 70% of Republicans and a large chunk of independents, we're talking certainly tens of millions of people. And if even, you know, a fraction of those people hold onto that kind of political stance, that's, that's a huge change. That's a huge change that has implications uh, in a lot of different ways. Um, I mean, you asked about what it means for mainstream politics and people on the left. Well, uh, it um, for one thing means a major crisis in the Republican party. Um, and we've, we've seen that in terms of the kind of difficulties and um, uh, tensions and struggles that have been going on within the Republican Party over how do they deal with Trump? How do they deal with the stop the steal politics? How do they deal with the impeachment? All these things. Um, and I, I, I think it's, you know, it's not clear exactly how that's all gonna play out, but there are certainly tensions between, um, you know, those within more of the base of the party who are pulling uh, in a uh, direction that is at least challenging the legitimacy of the system versus more of a kind of establishment uh, wing of the party that is trying to rein them in, but also not wanting to uh, do so uh, too, uh, too blatantly because they don't wanna alienate their base. As far as what it means for um, the work of the left, I mean, <laughs> it, it is a, it, it's a very difficult situation. I mean, um, you know, this is, it, it's not fundamentally new, but, but it, it highlights and intensifies the, the fact that we, we face a, a, a double-edged challenge. I mean, on the one hand, we face um, the, the growing and increasingly militant uh, forces of the far right that have some really scary goals of uh, what they want to do with society. Um, and those are forces that uh, uh, pose an immediate danger to people in many communities, as well as uh, longer term threats of, of various kinds. And so, you know, we need to look at how do we C combat those uh, those forces and and um, you know what to what extent do we need to enter into coalitions to uh, to combat them? At the same time, there is the continuing reality that we live in a society that is deeply oppressive, that is uh, deeply dehumanizing and alienating and disempowering for the vast majority of people to varying degrees, and. Um, it would be uh, dangerous and self-defeating for leftists to simply ally with the center and the forces of the state and the forces of the current administration against the, um, the insurgent far right. This is Bob Lederer, and I'm speaking with authors Matthew Lyons and Chloe on an analysis of the far right in the wake of the January 6th assault on the Capitol and you're listening to Out FM on WBAI.
Now I'd like to focus on the differences between far-right groups that have been created or activated since Trump's election in 2016 and that joined the Capitol assault in January. Matthew, in a recent essay, you write, quote, explicit calls for all people of color and usually all Jews to be subordinated, excluded, or killed are less common among US far-rightists than various forms of cultural racism in which limited numbers of people of color are accepted as long as they conform to Eurocentric rules and don't challenge underlying disparities of power, unquote. So let me ask both you, Matthew and Chloe, um, to talk more about the ideological differences within the far right concerning race, including um, the talk that's been increasing in, in recent months by groups like the Oath Keepers uh, about their so-called color blindness. Um, so what are the implications of this more undercover racism for the rights recruitment of different sectors of white people and also of small but growing numbers of people of color? So, um, Chloe, you want to go first? Yeah, I think starting with the Oath Keepers. Um, so the Oath Keepers were actually founded during the Obama administration. Um, and they, for the most part, have never kind of explicitly identified as a white supremacist or white nationalist organization. And usually when people accuse them of doing so, they definitely will say that's not how they see themselves. Um, and the Oath Keepers, kind of along with a number of other organizations in the far right, like Patriot Prayer and even Proud Boys, have done exactly what Matthew Lyons mentioned in his article, which is accepting some number of people of color um, in their ranks generally and not identifying as white supremacist or white nationalist, but also largely um, promoting many of the types of ideas and ideologies and actions that promote white supremacy. So they're pretty virulently anti-immigrant. Um, there's a really strong thread of anti-Muslim sentiment. Um, they're oftentimes very anti-LGBTQ and kind of have a strong sense that the identity of this country is Christian and usually tend to kind of uphold this idea of being um, a constitutionalist or relating to the constitution, which has really racial undertones when you look at the history of what that has, how those arguments have been waged through history, um, really leading back to the, the South and the Confederate arguments um, around the time of reconstruction in the United States. And kind of following along the same exact lines of people who were fighting against integration or um, voting rights for formerly enslaved people. So I think that there's both the historical legacy that a group like the Oath Keepers um, comes from and also leans on in terms of how they identify themselves. And then there's also um, kind of looking historically at what they are responding to. And so the fact that there is a group of armed militia, many of whom have come out of the military and police forces as well, that truly saw Obama as a socialist and really kind of rallied around trying to create a more local or sovereign type society because they thought Obama represented a federal government that was no longer representing them you know, has like such racial undertones that I think we need to see, we need to be able to tear apart a couple of things here, which is, it is important how groups see and define themselves. Um, and then also it's important for us as analysts and for those who are fighting for a free society to also understand historically <laughs> um, what, groups like Oath Keepers are responding to. But I think it can get a little bit confusing at times because, you know, if we're only looking at identity, for example, 
And we see a group like the Proud Boys have a leader who's a person of color, um, it can get a little bit confusing. So Matthew, what do you think? Um, I would just add a couple of things. I, I think that uh, one is just that the, the kind of you know, limited uh, multiracial membership that, that Chloe described in terms of groups such as the Proud Boys is something that you also see um, on a larger scale within uh, sectors of the Christian right, uh, such as the New Apostolic Reformation movement, which is a, a very large uh, Christian theocratic movement that has literally millions of followers. I mean, this is actually an international movement with very uh, significant membership in Asia and Africa and Latin America, as well as in North America. Uh, and within North America, it includes significant uh, membership of, uh, by people of color. Um, and similarly reflects or embodies this kind of um, uh, colorblind ideology as opposed to an explicit um, white supremacist ideology. The other thing I, I, I would just wanna add is that um, it would be a mistake to interpret this situation as simply a matter of hypocrisy or as, you know, that a, a group such as the Oath Keepers is, you know, just hiding their true views. I think they're, they're sincere when they claim to be colorblind. I mean, there is a, there's a, there's a, a, there's an inherent kind of self delusion in just the whole ideology of colorblindness, but I don't think that they're lying when they say that this is what they believe. I think that it's a matter of, um, there are different kinds of racist ideologies that are at work in the far right as there are in US society. And the fact that a significant portion of the far right embraces and uh, promotes colorblind ideology um, reflects the fact that um, that is a, uh, it, it's a form of racial ideology that is widely accepted among white people in the United States in a way that explicit white supremacism is not. Um, and that gives them a kind of entree, entree to a uh, much wider sector of the population than they would have if they were simply espousing a kind of traditional uh, Klan style or Nazi style uh, racism. This is Bob Lederer and I'm speaking with authors Matthew Lyons and Chloe on an analysis of the far right in the wake of the January 6th assault on the US Capitol. And you're listening to Out FM on WBAI. Now, uh, I want to ask you about um, the fact that uh, there are other differences among far, far right groups, not only around the question of race, but also the questions of gender and sexuality. Uh, for instance, Matthew Lyons, uh, one of our guests, writes, quote, there's a branch of the Christian right that wants to create a full-blown theocracy. And that vision centers not only on religion, but also on patriarchy, heterosexism, and enforced gender roles, unquote. Now, many liberals and leftists don't see the Christian right as part of the far right and, and um, generally not as part of the violent sector of the right. So let me ask you, Chloe, um, to talk about the interaction between these two sectors of the right and how the Christian right has targeted women and LGBTQ people and in recent months has particularly escalated their attack on transgender rights. So I think it's important to understand that there's a long, a fairly long history that goes back several decades of the Christian right and kind of the more insurgent elements of the Christian right forming actually a pretty close alliance with the racist right. And this goes back to a meeting that happened um, that many people speak about as actually the formation of the militia movement. But essentially a form of the Christian right that is 
kind of goes by Christian reconstructionism was really interested in trying to bring about a theocracy partially by a decentralized approach. And we're interested in um, kind of forming small models of groups that would be erecting Christian theocracy at the local level. And they saw an alliance in the racist right to go about doing that. And if you fast forward until today, some of these sectors that seem like they're very separate, militia groups like the Oath Keepers, for example, and others who are specifically fighting um, against a abortion rights for abortion or fighting against uh, LGBTQ people. At, but if you do a bit of a deeper dive, you can actually see that there's many overlaps between these groups and also their ideologies and um, a lot less of a kind of firm barrier between them. So for example, at some point I started looking more deeply into a kind of constellation of groups that um, understand themselves as abortion abolitionists. They've been on the fringe movement of the Christian right for quite a long time. They are the kinds of groups that actually backed um, murdering uh, people who abortion providers in the 90s. And if you look a bit deeper, you see that actually a number of the groups that were kind of behind actually violent anti-abortion acts were actually literally a part of the 1990s militia movements. And today you see something very similar, which is that you have groups like the Oath Keepers or even um, their contingency within law enforcement, which is called the Constitutional Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association. Many of them are not just fighting um, for a white nation, but literally will speak to the kinds of issues that they're looking at in a very similar way as the early Christian reconstructionists. And they're actually fighting to maintain a Christian nation. They see that rights for um, women's reproductive health or people rights for people to express their sexuality and gender are all signs that the state has become secular and are all abominations of the true way to be living this society. And some of them are trying to fight by any means necessary to make sure that that doesn't happen. Well, um, in the same vein, many sectors of the far right and, and uh, our guest Chloe has just been referring to some examples, but I would cite uh, in addition, Proud Boys and QAnon um, have made misogyny, homophobia and transphobia important parts of their ideology and their targeting of oppressed people. So, um, Chloe, can you talk about how these groups use this kind of attack to attract more supporters and to advance their violent agenda? And in particular, the example of Marjorie Taylor Greene, the Georgia Republican who is was recently elected to the U.S. House, um, who has openly embraced QAnon and just had her wrist slapped by the House Democrats who tossed her off the committee she sits on. Um, so how do you see these attacks as reinforcing the racist, anti-Jewish and anti-woman attacks of these same movements? And also what are the key differences among the different far right groups on these questions of uh, gender and sexuality? So for someone like Marjorie Taylor Greene, um, who really rose to fame in Georgia, partially through kind of being as um, bold, far right, anti-LGBTQ, anti-Muslim, anti-immigrant as she could in some ways, and kind of as a way to almost gain fame and to gain a liking within various far right movements. You can specifically see early on that she was like, re so she herself identifies as Christian. She, um, at least in terms of the narrative that she used, she speaks a lot of kind of language that is specifically re referencing the Christian right and of also the Patriot movement. But early on one of, in her Twitter feeds, for example, she's talking about how 
the drag queens in the area are having a drag queen reading group and how the reading group is a way that they're trying to advance a neo-Marxist agenda that's trying to destroy the very fabric of the United States. And you can see how that type of quote goes viral and is liked by so many different people in her midst. Now that she has actually made it into Congress, she's already uh, sponsoring a bill that would make it so that young trans and genderqueer athletes can't compete um, in women's sports in schools. And so it's, I think it's, it's important to note how it's both something that is like a central part of her politics, but also something that I think actually allows her to speak to her base. And I, I just wanna say one thing, which is that if you do some kind of deeper reading of how they view the world, it's, it's a kind of almost conspiracy theory where neo-Marxists, black people, um, Islamo-fascists, queer people are all trying to come together and kind of destroy the United States as we know it. And that she and these patriot movement groups are the defenders of the true United States. And so I, it's this kind of strange conspiracy theory that is obviously incredibly dangerous and, and leads to people like Proud Boys and others actually violently harassing and attacking um, trans and queer people. But it's something that is like, you know, a part of, I think goes way back to this kind of Christian nationalist ideas that she's panders to. Okay, and the final question for, for uh, this part of our discussion is that uh, both of you have written uh, about your very serious concern uh, as to the political response to the assault on the Capitol from the, from the establishment politicians has been um, President Biden has said he'll put forward a, a bill against domestic terrorism. Other uh, uh, centrists and even liberals are saying um, that uh, we need legislation to increase police presence at protests, to adopt further me measures to criminalize dissent. Um, and so Chloe wrote in a recent essay along with B. Sandor, quote, what is this political amnesia we have? Within a moment, the momentum and political consciousness gained after years of anti-police struggles that culminated in the mass movements against the murder of George Floyd seemingly went in reverse. So as we close out this part, let me have uh, you, Chloe, start and then Matthew talk about um, what are the, the risks of this type of legislation and this sort of consensus that this is of course needed to contain the dangerous right wing um, and that even liberals and some leftists uh, are are getting on board with that train. Yeah, I think that the liberal establishment, including the Democratic Party, would really want people, including progressives and radicals, to see them as our savior against the far right and to put you know, our hope in their ability to build out more surveillance, more police responses to the far right as the ultimate enemy. And I think it's important right now, probably more than ever to have a three-way fight analysis where we understand that the multiracial neoliberalism that the Democratic Party represents right now is not the only way forward against the insurgent violent far right, that indeed we need to actually have a liberatory alternative to both and really believe that there is a possibility building on the momentum of what happened over the summer to chart a course that is actually about the emancipation and freedom of all people. And I'll give the last word to Matthew Lyons. Well, that was such a great word to end on, but I will just note that um, there's a long history of uh, anti-fascism being misused to bolster state repression, most blatantly during World War II when it was used as a rationale for uh, 
the mass imprisonment of Jasmineese Americans, as well as a number of other repressive measures. And uh, in more recent decades, uh, for example, following the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995 by neo-Nazis, uh, the Clinton administration used it as a rationale to push through repressive legislation that uh, represented serious attacks on civil liberties and made it more difficult for people on death row to appeal their convictions. This is scary stuff. And uh, so it's, it, as Chloe said, it's important for us to chart, chart an independent course for a liberatory political uh, path that, that rejects the, um, the um, you know, state repression as, as, as a way to combat the far right. And I wanna thank our guests, Matthew Lyons, a uh, writer on right-wing politics, who uh, is the author of the book, Insurgent Supremacists, the US Far Right's Challenge to State and Empire, uh, and, and other writings as well. And I want to thank Chloe, who is an investigative reporter uh, focused on the far right and other issues, and a contributor to the blog, uh, which uh, Matthew also writes for, called Three Way Fight. Um, and that's uh, available at threewayfight.blogspot dot com. And uh, thank you for being with us. And there are so many issues that we realize we really need to dissect concerning the January 6th attack on the Capitol and the aftermath that we're actually going to do a part two of this interview, uh, which we will broadcast uh, in the near future. Stay tuned for announcements about the date of that part two. So thank you very much. This is Bob Letterer for Out of Fam, and I want to thank uh, co-producer and my personal partner, John Riley, for his insights and assistance in putting together these interviews. Thank you very much.